thanks to everyone for being here and for uh, indulging me um, for a little while today. I'm hoping to, to share with you some technical aspects of how, uh, how a DMA, how an assessment this specific and this complex um, can be done technically. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to also take away some operational insights um, and maybe some thoughts around sort of the practical aspects and, and, and what that means for context and level of detail and also in terms of what you can do to build a wider ecosystem around um, digital uh, maturity assessments. Meisterworks is a, a small company. I would like to think of us as a, as a relatively young company with a relatively old team. Um, in one form or another, we've worked together for many years. We do data, we do information. Our passion is in, in obtaining information, um, processing it, making it useful, which is something that applies to organizations, both in government, um, but also in the private sector. I would say about 50% of our work is with, with government um, of some form um, or another. And that um, brings the DMA into a particular focus for us with our prior knowledge in healthcare um, in technology, but also in the fields of some practical aspects of asking people questions, working out who to ask what questions, how to put them, um, and so on. We kind of sit at a, a nexus of three different areas of, of knowledge that we feel you really need to be able to put the DMA together. When we first started working with the, uh, the NHS in the UK, um, this would have been around 2014 roughly, there were some very fundamental questions around digital maturity assessments. There was a beginning understanding in the community about why we need it, what it's for, and what people were hoping to, to get from it. This is against the backdrop of, um, uh, my colleague earlier mentioned it, the National Programme for IT Investment, which brought its own problems about, but also its learnings. At that point, the NHS's best attempt at a digital maturity assessment was a series of Excel sheets that um, were sort of sent around for filling in and mainly focused on desktop technologies like antivirus and what kind of browser do you have and, and you know that sort of stuff. So and I think it was completed to about 20 or 30 percent and it kind of crystallized the amount of effort and the amount of thought that would have to go into the execution of what we were about to do. Coming in at that point was a clear advantage for us because the, how, how the task was framed was really in strategic terms and there wasn't any dictate about what the tooling would have to look like or, or what the best method was. It was just, we want to make our healthcare system digital. We don't want to do it by trial and error, i.g. unintelligently. We want to do it intelligently. We want to see what works and what doesn't work. And we want to get better at doing it. And so really the brief, if you want, was to say, well, we, what we need is, first of all, some baseline data. Where's everyone currently at? What do they have? What do they don't have? What's the direction of the speed of travel? So I should digress for a second and say that by that time, IT investments and in digital developments were largely devolved to trust leadership rather than sort of being steered at a national level. And so that meant that everyone had different ideas about what they needed, how it would best be done, what money should be available to do it with, what money was in fact available to do it with, um, and it kind of was driving disparity um, sort of across the, the healthcare network. And then the big thing really was outcomes. So what are we really, get, we really getting out of our various investment initiatives? What are we really getting out of doing e-prescribing or what are we really getting out of electronic health records? Um, and shared learning. What works, what doesn't work, what are ways that we can transfer to other places of how to implement stuff. So a big topic was change management, for example, and sort of the amount of work that's needed with, with staff in change management to, to ensure that the money gone on IT investments wasn't being wasted. And then there were some challenges, which um, we knew about from previous work serving and questionnaires and that kind of stuff. Um, and specifically with work amongst the, um, the health and care community in England. And the top level priority here was information fragmentation. The sum of things that we wanted to know to form a 
cohesive DMA weren't all known to the same people. So there wasn't one guy that we could ask all of this. Some of the knowledge was in IT, possibly at director level. Other stuff was further down the hierarchy. Um, there were um, clinical directors, there were staff, um, and I fully agree with the person asking the question earlier. We pretty quickly realized that it's essential that we're able to ask questions, firstly at the right level, but then also at multiple levels within organizations. There was a, a problem with buy-in. So in the NHS at that time, there were a lot of demands on trusts to make central submissions, all kinds of stuff, um, reporting waiting times, reporting uh, all, all manner of things. Um, there was a general view within that population that you know, they didn't want to do anything else. They didn't want to have to submit yet another thing, um, particularly because there were different experiences with making submissions in the past in other areas about how central um, administration would react to the data being submitted. So we knew that we needed to be able to deliver some benefits locally pretty much immediately. And we knew that we needed to make sure no one felt we, wasted, we were wasting their time, like, e.g. with inefficient tooling or irrelevant questions or so all of that, that kind of fat. Um, we had absolutely no room for it. It needed to be trimmed off. Next, there were some... I call them idiosyncrasies or odysseys. Um, I think every healthcare system probably has them, um, and so does the NHS. There are different kind of roles and different kind of things. There are some um, very closely guarded responsibilities um, about who makes strategy decisions, who writes strategy, who inputs into it, where money comes from, where investments are being planned in sort of strategic terms, but also in, in um, structural terms. So in, in the Scottish NHS, for example, there are some, uh, what they call them special health boards, and they range from the central mental health facilities to things like 999 um, uh, nine or 111 emergency services, for example. And they're important structurally, but they're very different from almost every other institution in the healthcare system. Yet we had to include them in order to gain acceptance for what we were doing. And then there was an overarching critical mass thread. Completing half the field work, work would render the entire data set almost useless, both in terms of its actual statistical usefulness, but also in terms of, in terms of if it's, its relevance, its believability. Um, and so it was pretty clear for us that well, we kind of had to put it all out there and make sure that we get as, as many voices into our data collection as we possibly could. What the, um, well, ultimately the NHS, but sort of with our, our consulting um, came up with, was a fairly high level of standardization. So we um, ended up grouping um, information into three top level themes, uh, readiness, which broadly talks about whether an organization is even capable of digitization, so is there leadership, do we have strategy, other resources, can you do the sort of governance that we know uh, is needed for efficient digitization, as well as uh, information skills and training amongst the workforce. And then there was a, a second theme, which was uh, capabilities. And that really was about the about processes, about clinical and other processes. So records, for example, orders, medication, um, transferring the handling of care to other departments or other, other facilities, as well as some topics around decision support, telehealth, business intelligence standards. Um, we later added some, some others um, uh, as well. Um, but this was sort of the core set of information that, that we started with. And then uh, finally, a much smaller infrastructure section. Really, our, our approach to this whole, whole DMA idea wasn't very IT-based. It was, was outcome-based, which is why infrastructure is something that we spend relatively little time and resources on. Nonetheless, it was there. It's mainly about specific things we knew were issues such as uh, network quality, um, device availability, support availability, and sort of um, strategies and policies around replacing devices, um, updating software, and uh, that sort of thing. When I say that the uh, the concept of the DMA was or is rather mainly uh, outcome based, what I mean is that we were talking about whether digitization for certain processes was being achieved rather than asking about how it was achieved. 
And this is really something that we, um, we gathered from an exercise doing HIMSS assessments amongst members of the, um, the UCL Partners Network um, at the time, where we would so often find, and, and this is um, um, just like my colleague uh, Marta said earlier, sort of the problem with, with incremental um, digital maturity models. You get, we go into trust that we'd see people who've spent a vast amount of local effort developing very good and very specific uh, systems on an Oracle base, for example. And it's something that incremental models can't recognize. They don't recognize that as a system, they recognize it as, as an implementation of something. And so even though they were achieving uh, relatively early, actually, in, in the case I'm thinking of, uh, uh, really good and efficient ways of handling orders and, and uh, sort of lab processes um, and, and pharmacy orders um, within their trust, they gained relatively low score in our assessments. And this is really one of the things that led us to doing things process-based. So we'd ask things like, what percentage of your lab orders are done paperlessly, for example. Now, we couldn't do away with sort of all kind of factual data uh, uh, kind of submissions. And we actually had some of them in almost every section of the DMA. And we sort of refer to them as the, the, the baseline uh, information points. So, you know, things like how many records are digitized, to what extent are they digitized, what form of digitized or information structure do you have, and stuff like that. And we come to know these kinds of things as reach questions. They would tell us what the reach of digitization in an organization was at the time, followed by a lot of um, questions asked on a like at scale about whether particular indicators that we knew to be relevant for a definition of what good looks like. And then the other thing that sort of became relatively clear to us is that in order for the, the DMA to do what we thought might become one of its roles at the time, which is helping not only individual healthcare units, e.g. healthcare trusts, um, but actually wider healthcare economies to formulate digital strategies and make plans and assess progress. And so for that reason, we made sure that we were relevant and efficient um, and not frustrating to people completing the DMA in you know, as far as social care, primary care, community care, um, in the case of the Scottish DMA, even as far as the sort of um, ambulance services and you know, emergency services and that kind of stuff. And then in terms of aligning to the, the organizational hierarchy, the idea really was that we try and be efficient by asking questions at the right level and then building tools that will allow us to ask questions at different levels at the same time. So most of the questions a, a clinical director will be able to answer because they are asked at the level of information they, they will know about. So for example, how strongly do you agree with healthcare professionals can access information about patients when and where they need it, e.g. at the point of care? And then you have to like it scale from agree completely to disagree completely, which is very much within the purview of somebody leading uh, sort of clinical operations in a trust. But then we were also able to, to defer questions or rather have participants defer questions. So when we were getting too detailed with questions, our participants could say, well, okay, this is not for me. This is more detailed questions. I have staff for that. And they'd be able to, to use a very simple function that let them very quickly delegate individual parts of the assessment to others, which was a wild success. I think I, mean, I don't know the exact number, but delegations were in the thousands every time we did a round of assessments. And that really gave us sort of the specificity without adding a vast amount of, of, um, of workload for the people that we were talking to. I've talked about this a little bit already, but it, it, it kind of brings me sort of a little deeper into the, into the field of toolkit design. We, we knew we had to be easy to use, because otherwise people wouldn't have completed it and they certainly wouldn't have put the amount of time and effort into it. We knew that the organizations were querying were different in terms of setup. They had, some of them had e-health leads, others didn't. Some of them had resources to complete this just at management levels. Others were interested in, in, in going a little deeper and involving others. So there was a whole lot of flexibility that we kind of had to hand over to to the organizations um, and kind of let them sort of configure on the fly how they wanted to, to deal with the, with the DMA. And so we did this by um, 
building specific navigation that was specific to the DMA and sort of only really covered what they needed to see at the time. We used a simple way of, of querying things. We used a, a Likert scale. We almost made an, an opinion poll, a professional informed opinion poll, because we knew it would suffice for what we wanted to do with the data. And we knew it would save a vast amount of time on the part of the person providing the data. Uh, I mean, even in, in the, the sort of latest DMAs we've done, we know that it would have been a multiple effort um, of, of what people had to put in to do anything more specific. So I know sometimes the, the approach can be to ask for specific data that people have to pull from management systems or describe things in detail. For our statistical requirements in terms of comparing and contrasting trusts against each other as well as tracking their progress over time, we just didn't need that. And then finally, we needed to be able to be adaptable. The set of questions that we, we launched with was to ask very much a, a kind of a transitional thing. So we knew eventually we'd not need other questions. It was obvious. Other things were pulled into focus in, in the future, but also as organizations progress and become more digitally mature, the topics that are relevant to tracking their progress become more detailed, they become grainier. And uh, so you can no longer measure progress in terms of how is your telehealth doing or how is your medicines administration doing? It's too large a unit. Just like healthcare in itself, that kind of adds more and more products and niches to the, uh, to the, the shelf of, ava of available process. The DMA has to evolve in, in, in the same way. Um, and we knew that. So, um, so we made sure that we can extend what we do, not only in terms of depth, but also in terms of breadth. We, in later DMAs, we added new sections, we added new questions, and we um, also added some tools that would prepare DMAs for the, the more sort of complex uses of the future. In Scotland, we've introduced uh, an evidence uh, component where people participating in the DMA had the opportunity to upload documentary evidence for the answers they were given, giving. So people might upload stats from their um, medical record system, for example, or so look at um, patient uh, reported outcomes or any, anything like that, really, any kind of medium, it could be documents, or they could even make recordings if they wanted to. And the reason for that was twofold. Firstly, um, we were planning on doing validations um, with trusts, and we wanted to make those efficient. So rather than sort of arriving at um, uh, sort of healthcare provider and asking all the questions from the very beginning and taking a lot of staff time, we were able to review a lot of documentary evidence submitted and kind of answer half the questions already and sort of just sort of attend for three, four hours, clarify some things and check on some stuff. We also know that eventually funding for things would be tied to DMA submissions. So we needed some way of substantiating the, the submissions and the score that the DMA provided. There was a real need and a real kind of focus on instant rewards for the people taking part. We knew it was important for them taking part in the first place for, for getting the really critical sort of um, uh, coverage that will allow us to produce a data set of value. But also, um, we knew that, I mean, there's, there's different approaches you can take to, to completing a DMA, and, and we've seen different approaches. You can you can race through it in two hours, or um, you can, like was the case in um, some of the, the recent Scottish submissions, spend something like three, four hundred staff hours over over three months on it. These are extremes, but but ultimately, what we need is for people to spend the amount of effort and, and kind of give it the amount of respect that would give credibility to the data set in the community. And so we've mainly achieved that by feeding back. We, um, we were sure that giving information about their own submissions and also some access to the wider data set and, and analysis of that would be interesting and useful to, to most trusts, um, which proved true. Uh, the problem we had to overcome is that not, not everyone is as comfortable with, with data and analytics. Not everyone is at the, at the same level. Some people read charts, but don't make them, and other people um, build complex data models in, in cubes in their own applications. And we really needed to cover all of these. So we ended up implementing some very really quick, easy to read dashboards, complement that with a 
self-service analytics solution where people could kind of build their own charts and graphs and, and benchmark against um, other trusts and that kind of stuff. And then for the advanced user, um, we'd offer downloads of current data sets to use as they please locally. At central level, um, we offered something very similar. We built some um, dedicated data exports, um, which were used to feed things like uh, my NHS, for example, as well as various sort of analytical processes inside NHS. And then for other stakeholders in the system, we built customized dashboard that would just let them look at a snapshot of the state of the nation, essentially. And then lastly, we knew that the logical conclusion for almost everybody completing this thing was that there is benefit in organizing the various nodes in the wider network, having a community around the, the digital maturity topic. So things like sharing access to outputs from the tool, being able to compare and contrast, kind of being able to pull up statistical next neighbors, things like that. But then also kind of pointing towards next steps. So things like user-generated content, for example. We've recently implemented system XYZ, and what we've done is ABC, here's a little case study we've written, and that will be available to users. Now, nobody reads this stuff when it's hard to find. Um, so we build a, a signposting system. So if, uh, say, um, pharmacy systems um, were something that your score indicated you were still working on, we'd signpost you to content of people that you know, showed in some kind of way how pharmacy systems could be done, case studies, that sort of thing. And then ultimately, we also um, ended up using the same scores to make suggestions about knowledge arbitrage um, opportunities. So the reasoning was that if you have people who use relatively similar uh, macro setups, so say single system or departmental system, and have issues in certain areas where some people have just mastered sort of, um, digital maturity advancements in the same area, stands the reason that talking to each other can't hurt. Um, so we ended up making introductions on the basis of the uh, scores that arrived from the assessment. So what, what happened, <laughs> basically, a few things. Um, so firstly, there's a lot of activity. There's about roughly 250 healthcare trusts in the uh, acute healthcare trusts in the in, in England and another 30 or 40 or so in Scotland, we got a total of 1,300 users um, to complete assessments on our systems from 300 organizations, which is uh, basically everyone. There are a thousand complete assessments, not all at the same time, not all in the same place. And our participation rate is somewhere north of 95%. And this is kind of the other uh, critical mass threat I was, you know, we were worried about in the beginning. If that number had been much lower, we would have had a real problem with justifying the data set. But fortunately, we were able to make it interesting and valuable enough for people to complete it. And then just on sort of involving voices from every level of the organization, two of the tools we included for our, um, our respondents, our participants, were aimed specifically at that. One of which is, we call it polling, which lets you take a group of colleagues whom you consider knowledgeable in a certain area, and pass a single question to them and say, hey, my, you know, I have an opinion on this, but I want to see what you think. And sort of without kind of lengthy meetings or setups or wait times, they'd be able to shoot us a question and get a response, see it so in the context of, this, of their, their screen, basically with little dots on a scale. And they could then take a view as to where, you know, where they sort of qualitatively saw the average of, of those opinions and, and how they wanted to respond. But we also realized that management especially in the view of uh, sort of ground level staff can sometimes be a little removed from, from what the latest situation uh, at staff level is. So we included a, um, a staff survey, which basically included all of the, the questions that could be answered in numbers because we need to be able to provide a, a summary dashboard to our, back to our participants that were suitable for staff to answer. And basically they could, at a click of a button, get a link, email that out to all their staff and say, okay, how, how easy is it really to access our digital system or to what extent do you really have access at the point of care and sort of things like that. And this is the last number that I'm showing sort of in the green bit on my, on my slide here. In our last iteration in Scotland, trusts had 5,000 staff complete these questions, which is extraordinary, really. And they were able to base a lot of their, their answers on it. And they also told us when we talked to uh, 
the participants later on. That was a really, really valuable tool. So we'll build on that for the future too. Some of the things that were made possible by the DMAs in, in the UK, fairly early on, local digital roadmaps. So up until that point, for a local health economy to share information about the digital maturity, discuss it, and much less being able to form a strategy that's relevant to the to the to, to the local local region, to the local health population, it was a really difficult thing to do because there was no standardized assessment. You know, they, they weren't even on agreed terms in, in, in terms of de defining measures and, and talking about stuff. So this is something that that was made much easier by the um, by the DMA. Being able to identify and discover global digital exemplars was something that the DMA has supported. For CCGs to do regional analysis and form detailed investment plans based on the needs of all of the, the organizations uh, in their realm. So just for those of you who are not aware, a CCG is a is a commissioning unit, essentially a, a sort of procurement unit, but it also governs for a, a, a local group of healthcare providers and primary and secondary care, what's needed and, and what the priorities are and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So for them to form an IT investment strategy for the local health economy um, was greatly um, enabled um, by, by DMA data. In Scotland, the Scottish government has recently published its renewed national digital healthcare strategy on the back of um, DMA work. And very recently, Scottish government has been able to respond to the new telehealth requirements because they had baseline data, very fresh baseline data um, for telehealth um, capabilities in the community. So um, where are we going next? We know that there will be, that there, there are an increasing, there is an increasing range of experts on different topics relevant to digital maturity in healthcare providers. They will need to get work together and they will need to work together more closely because the topics, as I mentioned, that we're measuring are also becoming more fragmented. So um, in one of our next versions, we'll be able to handle larger groups of contributors with much, much greater ease. Um, you'll be able to put together different work groups. You will be able to enable instant workshops for those groups. So these are essentially Zoom rooms like the one you're in now, um, but they're always on. So it's just a question of, sort of popping into a room and talking to one another, sort of almost ad hoc, like you're sitting in the same office. There will be um, a much more advanced sharing manager. Um, so you'll be able to assign questions and sections and, and, and that sort of stuff um, on a much more granular basis in a much easier way to different people in your work groups. We'll introduce free-form staff surveys. Because of technological reasons, we were limited to kind of predefining what goes into a staff survey in the past. And everyone had to ask the also our predefined set of questions. But in the, we recognize that this is also something that's better managed at local level. And so you'll be able to add you know, pretty much anything you want with very few limitations to your staff service that you send out. You'll also be able to have more than one staff survey. And then the other thing that, we expect is that as we're covering subjects in greater detail with greater granularity, there will be more need for context and support. We also know that we won't have any more capacity for content or length or effort or anything like that. So what we're building are ways of delivering support and information around the topics that, we, that we're discussing without taking more time off our participants' hands. And this may mean things like dynamic content, so you know, better tool tips, animated information, multimedia content, um, just where it's needed, a predictive approach to offering support. So if you, if you haven't looked up anything for the first 10 questions in a section, we're not going to push content on you for the next 20. We'll be able to offer technical support in a more efficient way. So essentially, in, in this case, by sort of using instant screen shares. So you know you can, you can click a button and talk to one one of our support staff and say, hey, I don't understand that. Why am I, why is this not happening? And you can share your screen with us and we'll be able to probably solve it in half the time, I think. And then the other thing um, that we're we're doing to respond to the greater degree of granularity is is kind of supporting participating organizations better in terms of 
the granularity which with, with which their, their time sort of intervals are are available. So rather than sort of being able to update your assessment once a year or when whenever um, uh, sort of central management sees fit, we'll be we'll be able to um, let you define the frequency at which you want to monitor progress because it's becoming increasingly important to justify investments and track benefits from investments almost instantly. And so this is really what this is for. You, you can run a program, um, you can update your assessments, you can monitor benefits and, and kind of integrate with the DMA in terms of being able to show that what you, what you were hoping to achieve has or hasn't been achieved. 